we then made a production piece that did that, where you sat down, it hit here and hit here, so it was fail safe, so it didn't didn't uh, break apart. And then as you sat back, it gave um, this joint, so it was a quite a functional shape, even though it looks like it wasn't. <clears throat> and then we started squishing it. <laughs> <laughs> That was the most comfortable piece we made, actually, this one. And then we got fooling around. Life magazine got interested, and they wanted to know if we could do some, something jazzy, and so. <laughs> I call this our boneyard. We were trying to develop knuckles and things that interconnected, and the intention was to to create a system of some kind that you just made the same parts and they'd interlock and form tables and desks and things. And this wasn't the way to go. <laughs> and these were some of the pieces that became commercially acceptable. This one was a big favorite. So is this. I just wanted to show this, not to sh to show, I'm bored with the stuff now, but it's part of the, it was part of the process. It wasn't just something we, we were screwing around with on the side. It really was intended. It started out to really be part of the, the uh, interior systems and a part of the, the uh, store fixturing. And uh, then the guys with the money got in, screwed it all up. Are those being made by somebody right now? No, they're not. Uh, it's a, that's a whole other story. They sold at Bloomingdale's for about uh, a month or two, and the projected sales were $3 million, and, and my stock ownership was worth over a million dollars for about two weeks. <laughs> and I got really freaked and quit. <laughs> These are some of the pieces that were... That table, by the way, sold retail. <laughs> that table sold for $100, and this, we had to prove, we had to do all kinds of things to prove to uh, the retail stores that this stuff would, would hold up. It was incredible. I mean, uh, they said that it had to be, <laughs> they said it had to be fireproofed, and uh, Bloomingdale's did, when they were the first shot at this. And uh, so I said, okay. We can fireproof it, and we figured out you can spray it with stuff, you know, like you do fabric, and for 50 cents a piece you could fireproof it. And we fireproofed it and took it in, showed it to them, and, and they were happy, and then they said now they can put it on the floor. I said, yeah, our advertisement is going to say this is the only furniture in Bloomingdale's that's fireproofed. Is that okay? <laughs> How did I get what on top of what? How did you get the car on top of the How did I get the elephant on top? <laughs> Where did you find the elephant? <laughs> the car was nothing. The elephant was really <laughs> This was this picture was taken by Life magazine and the PR gal is right here. Her fingers are there sticking out. And when they sh we told them that the elephant could only stand over the support, of course. He couldn't stand mid-span or he'd crack it. So they got him up there with a ramp of some kind that, that they all worked out. And then the guy, the photographer got back, shot the picture. The flash bulb scared the hell of the elephant. He went up on his legs and he came down, bam, in the middle, broke the thing into smithereens. <laughs> And uh, that was the end of that. At, after this, they made me go to Bloomingdale's, and, and if you ever anybody saw the Life magazine thing, they had me jump up in the air and land on this on this thing. And the guy told me a trick how to look like I jumped high, so I the, it's, I look like a fantastic athlete. <laughs> Any more? <laughs> Okay, in 1967, that's back to there again. Uh, same time the Merriweather, same time as the Magnin stores. Uh, we were asked by an artist friend, Billy Al Bengston,
to do an installation of his show, of his paintings at the LA County Museum of Art. We had just done one the same year for uh, Japanese art, uh, art treasures exhibit, and so the museum thought we were, we were safe to use. The, uh, it was okay to do it. And uh, all I wanted to do was build a very rough framework, because Billy's studio is much like these photographs. Some of this furniture comes from his studio. I just wanted to build an environment which uh, was sort of sympathetic to his work and the way it looked good around his place. Uh, so we just used cheap plywood and, and uh, corrugated metal and exposed studs and, and uh, some of the uh, art collectors brought in some of their furniture and put it around. And, And this installation, I started with. I started playing with the cor corrugated metal, uh, and liked it. It went very well with Billy's paintings, and and uh, Billy's work grows out of his involvement with motorcycles, and the metallic stuff, and the uh, candy apple surface. This all comes out of the auto industry, and his his involvement with those kind of things. So the corrugated metal seemed like a a fairly simpatico material. About the same time, I was asked by some friends to do a hay barn out at Mission Viejo. And uh, they own a huge ranch that's almost as big as Irvine. And they, own, they have race horses. And uh, there were no real functional requirements for this thing except that it keep the wind off the hay and that it uh, uh, protect it from rain. I started playing with a minimal sculpture. I guess at the time I was very interested in the work of Don Judd and, and uh, Carl Andre, other artists uh, whose work I'd been exposed to, and decided I'd, I'd, maybe I could become an artist on the side. And uh, so I started to pull that stuff into my work and uh, used uh, telephone poles and gang nail trusses and put this thing up in about a week, I guess, using corrugated iron. The uh, interesting thing about it is certain days the sky reflected in the corrugated and the, build, the roof disappeared, which really freaked me out. And I, I started uh, liking that and wanted to do more of those things. A couple of years later, I was approached by Ron Davis, an artist friend, about doing a studio in Malibu. And I took him around to show him all of our work, and uh, he liked this building the best. So I was, <laughs> I was really happy. If you know his work, he plays with perspective and, and trapezoidal shapes and, and forced perspectives. And uh, if you know him, he doesn't understand it three-dimensionally. It's strange that his work looks so three-dimensional, but he, his own sensibility is not uh, in 3D. It's very uh, flat. It's, it's painterly. Um, so we designed a big space. We worked a couple of years together, uh, collaborating and, and uh, designing a, a studio and a residence. So there are two buildings seated out in Malibu. Um, I wanted them to look like just giant pieces of primary sculpture that landed from Mars in some kind of odd configuration and didn't look like they, they were a residence, but were more like uh, in something in scale with the hills, you know, the tiny little house there, you can see all the cutesy pie little details, somehow uh, doesn't hold its own, doesn't stand up to the, the terrain. And the intent here was to try and do something that really, really uh, took nature on in a way. Pardon me, as you approach it, the road as you approach it, the thing, uh, you see it like this as a, as a uh, prow, you don't see the roof. And as you drive around it, uh, the roof starts to unfold, and the building changes quite a bit. You drive up the driveway, and it's uh, this building was built for sixteen dollars a square foot. It's an average of twenty feet high, so that. It's $16 a square foot for a 20-foot volume, which is quite interesting. 
Uh, we built it on a wood floor instead of a, a slab so that uh, the space inside could be changed. Much the same idea as the other building, the, the office building, that you could have access to heating and uh, electrical so that we didn't have to design the interior. We had a hell of a time getting a loan on this. The lenders didn't say they didn't, wouldn't accept this as a house. And finally, one of the art, art collectors who collects Ron's work uh, uh, gave him a loan, made it possible. Not through the metal, but through the skylights. We, did, we didn't, uh, we had some trouble with that at first. What about noise factors when it rained? We undercoated the roof like a car and put insulation. It's actually a built up roof underneath this. And then this is laid on, on top of, of uh, raised two by fours and screwed to those so that it's a, that's a standard detail if you, if you've been around a while, you, it's used a lot for this kind of thing. We didn't, there wasn't anything innovative in the structure or the, the detailing, just the, uh, the way we treated the space, the, the shape of the space, and... Uh, yeah, it, it goes down to a downspout that's down in this corner. I don't know if, I don't think I have a picture of it, but... It makes some noise. There it is, it comes down at this point and lands in this thing. And there's a drain going off. Originally the entrance was through a garage door in here and you know, the standard industrial thing. And uh, we finally entered, decided to enter on that side temporarily or at least for this go around. He didn't build the other building. This was originally intended to be the house and the other building, the studio. And some crazy things happened in his life. He ended up living alone. Because I think because of this this building process, it sort of. <laughs> if you if you ever get a client that's happily married, warn them that what's going to happen. <laughs> These pictures were taken just after it was finished. It's it's changing constantly. When when Ron first moved in. Uh, it took him a couple of years to get down to painting again. It really sort of uh, was intimidating to him. And uh, he didn't do much inside, except hang some of his beautiful paintings around and uh, made some attempts at things, but not, uh, nothing really got off the ground until about a year ago. And at first he wouldn't move anything in the, in the house and, and uh, wouldn't move a wall, everything became very precious, just the opposite of our, our intentions. Now he's moving walls and every time I go out there there's something else going on and he's really, it's, it's quite interesting to see it evolve and that was what I, I wanted to happen. I wanted him to have a place where he could get involved in, in the three-dimensional uh, space himself and, and hopefully it would, would uh, have an effect on his paintings or make, you know, be an enriching experience which finally did happen. There he is <laughs> in his loft. <clears throat> it's very hard to perceive this space from photographs. I think you have to, to actually be in it. Uh, there are endless illusions because of the, uh, none of the nothing's parallel so that Anything that is is rectangular has always got some funny relationship to it, and it, uh, it's unexpected always. And the reflections in the evening, when you get the reflections in the glass of the lights and so on, uh, uh, and the space, there's always un it's always unexpected. You can never really uh, predict it. Were there discussions of the kind of disorientation if possible by? Yes, there were. We spent a, uh, a lot of time soul searching that. And at first I was nervous about it and said I thought we ought to calm it down. To, we did a, another one that was a little, the, ang the angles were a little more subtle. But it, so we went into it with some trepidation. 
but I think it works. It's very restful out there. And what isn't, doesn't show in the photographs, the hills behind press in on these windows, so you almost feel like you're in a dollhouse and this giant is looking in on you. It's got a strange quality to it. And during the day, kids take those mo their motorbikes up the hill or horses up, walk up the ridge of the hill and you see them in one window or another. It looks like a <laughs> some uh, funny experiences. Ron bought himself a toy. Because <laughs> the architecture intimidated him so much, he became a composer. And his, his first record is coming out soon <laughs> of electronic music. He's an amazing guy. I, I don't know if he's here. OK, there's a, there's a loft on the other side uh, that you couldn't get to at this time because of the, we just built a. We built a painting room for him. He was so intimidated by the big space that we had to build a small room where he went to paint. How big is the space? It's 5,000 square feet. And for very little money, you can add double the square footage because it's all interior. So the, the idea was at some points he could have a three-story space and add rooms and so on. <laughs> what we've done since, since this photograph, in fact, in the last three months, is we have a stairway going from here to this Center, center ridge, which houses the uh, toilets and stuff. And then another a ramp going down the other side to the other uh, loft, so you can now walk around on the top. There's no functional reason for it. It's all just to, to uh, I don't know what. Uh, if, if you're an architect that's very involved, worried about little details and things, this wouldn't be your kind of thing because we just didn't get too involved with that. We, we tried to create, I'm sorry that we didn't clear span the thing. Uh, it was another $11,000 to do it. It would have just, it would have been nicer, but it, it doesn't finally bother me. And ducts and things just hang in there. Uh, we acted as editors almost as it was under construction. Just went out and the guy said he has, could do it this way or that way and we said okay. So a lot of the, of the decisions weren't made, like these ducts coming up and some of these forms. The interior shapes were not e ever def uh, done until the building was finished. That's the kitchen. I don't know, that's the hall or living room. I, we always end up sitting there. <laughs> so I guess that's the living room. Uh, what is the sky like in It's just uh, uh, wire glass. This is when he first moved in. He didn't have a, he wouldn't change anything. He hung up a few paintings of Coons, of Stella, his friends, and, and hung up with some speakers for his bukla. And uh, that was it. The floor, by the way, is just an epoxy paint on plywood, which has held up an awful long time. Okay, now we're starting in that same space, starting to bring the metal inside. We had a piece of metal that we uh, brought in, and uh, I don't know if you can see the, we had lines stretched across for the, for the stairs. Uh, we cut a hole in this, and there's a stairway that comes down here now. Here's a piece of cardboard furniture I made for him out of bigger stuff. So we're back to Billy Al Bengston's painting on the metal wall after four years. <laughs> Here you can see the uh, beginnings of the mock-up for the, the ramp that goes across from this space. This is a great space up here. I don't know what he's going to do with it, but uh, it's a nice place to go sit and have a drink and stuff. I don't have any pictures of his new paintings. It would have been probably good if I'd had some pictures of uh, the, the kind of art that turns me on and what sort of led me to this aesthetic and to have some pictures of Ron's new paintings. But these are some of the old things. You can see the, the uh, 
preoccupation with angles and, and spatial forms. There's some repetition here. These were the paintings he started working on that finally bust them loose. Now he's doing paintings that cover that whole wall that are very free and they almost look like Renaissance drawings. They're just incredibly beautiful. And they're, uh, they're very successful. I think, is that it? No. Nope. This is the Meriwether Post Pavilion in, in Columbia, Maryland that was done in, in 1966. It was a big trapezoidal sh uh, shape. Uh, we were hired in November of 66 and the building had to open in, in uh, July of 67. So we were given two weeks to design it, two weeks to order the steel and uh, we did working drawings as we went. The building was built in 90 working, d working days. And there were a lot of goof ups, including this one. <laughs> it was a simple shell designed for the uh, Washington Symphony. It was named the Meriwether Post Pavilion after Mrs. Post, who was quite a lady to, to encounter. This shows that detail and how we intended it. And that's what happened. The guy left out the... the <laughs> Since this day, they've uh, cut out these trees and they've added a thousand seats on each side in a big tent. And it doesn't look anything like this. They're big. Uh, this is a, was a clear span. They've now got big columns in to hold the tent stuff. This is another amphitheater that we're just finishing out in Concord, California. Uh, several other people in the office worked on this. Uh, Gene Cupper, who teaches at UCLA, one of them. And uh, um, this is a the terrain. A piece of land was given to the to the city of Concord by a developer who's going to build little houses all in these valleys, which he did. Uh, main highway with a very steep grade going up over the hill and generating a lot of truck traffic and noise. Our solution was to develop a crater, man-made crater that enclosed the space, cut off the sound from the, the freeway, and also helped cut down the, the uh, intensity of the prevailing winds. Parking was down here, is down here, and a, a ramp, a pedestrian ramp up to the amphitheater, much like the Hollywood Bowl, where you walk up a, a ramp and in, uh, but not as far. And you... Oh, 